Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Life Unites Us January webinar, Healing for the Healer, Facing the Stigma that Keeps Us and Our Patients Unwell. Very happy today to be joined by Dr. Angela Calistra, and excited to be talking a little bit more about this topic with you all. Uh, so as we get started, I encourage you all to use the chat, uh, drop in your name, where you're calling in from, always love to hear who's in the room with us. Um, in terms of housekeeping, the webinar will be recorded and a copy of the presentation will be available on the Life Unites Us website. All attendees will be muted. Uh, please use the Q&A panel on the bottom of your screen to ask questions. The chat is also available for general commentary, uh, but we always love to hear from you all in terms of um, how we do our Q&A session. So for best audio quality, please listen to the webinar via phone line by using the dial-in number. To switch from computer audio to phone audio, select audio settings on the lower left corner of your screen. And if you ever get disconnected from Zoom, please re-enter using the original link um, and we'll let you right back in. So briefly going over our agenda for today, uh, we will be starting with a welcome and housekeeping. Uh, I'll be doing a brief overview of the Life Unites Us campaign for any of you that are uh, coming in for the first time and joining us today. And then we'll be doing speaker introductions and diving right into the presentation. And we will wrap up with a question and answer at the very end. So going over a uh, brief overview of the Life Unites Us campaign. Life Unites Us is an evidence-based behavior change public health intervention that's designed to reduce addiction-related stigma of SUD in the state of Pennsylvania. We launched uh, in the fall of uh, 2020, so this is our fourth year being active in the state. Um, very happy to be working here. Um, and this is a collaborative relationship between Shutterproof Penn State and the Public Goods Project uh, in close partnership and funded through the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs. In terms of goals and objectives, uh, we have uh, increasing knowledge about substance use disorder and that recovery is not only possible but probable. Also hoping to improve attitudes towards those living with or in recovery from SUD and strengthening the capacity of stakeholders uh, who are already responding to the crisis and working on the ground. In terms of our pillars of work, they are threefold. So first and foremost is community engagement. Uh, our work aims to be extremely rooted with the community uh, and by and for the community. So we connect with uh, CBOs across the state of Pennsylvania uh, to get input on the direction of the campaign. Uh, to this effect, we formed a community impact committee at the very start of the campaign. So this is a group of uh, community members that represent different regions and organizations across Pennsylvania uh, that provide input um, on the direction of the campaign. So we have nine members that sit in our committee and they're incredibly helpful in all the work that we do. Um, the second pillar of our work includes content sharing. So if you're wondering how to support our campaign, the, the main way to do this is by sharing our content online to your networks. We are a digital media campaign primarily. So we collect stories from individuals in recovery, uh, their friends, their families, allies, anyone that's in, been impacted by SUD and share them via our social media channels and our networks. Um, and then we also provide educational content um, in the form of webinars, which you're attending right now by, on a bi-monthly basis, but also via our socials um, in terms of static posts and educational messaging that is really meant to improve attitudes across the state. This is just an example of what our content looks like. I would encourage you to visit our story library. We have some very touching uh, stories um, that you all can enjoy there. Um, and then just examples of what you might find on our social media channels. And that would usually be uh, my last slide, but do want to briefly talk about our community award grant program for any of you who may not be familiar with it. Um, our grant program is currently open and accepting applications. Um, so this is the third year that we are uh, open for applications. Um, the grant program was really created to empower community-based organizations in Pennsylvania to develop and implement outreach activities that decrease stigma and increase community understanding of SUD. So we're aiming to fund projects both big and small, um, and our deadline to receive applications is February uh, 9th. Um, so if you have any questions uh, or want to know more about how to apply or eligibility criteria, please visit our Life Unites Us website. Uh, we have a new tab right now um, that talks more about the grant program specifically, or you can always email me directly as well. 
So with that, I will go over um, and introduce Angie and then uh, give the floor over to her. So Angie uh, hails from wild and wonderful West Virginia and has settled down with her family in Pennsylvania. Her upbringing has driven her passion for her work. For over two decades, she has been working with individuals managing co-occurring disorders, lending her expertise to fields such as therapy, clinical supervision, education, and research. In addition to her current roles, she is faculty with the American Society of Addiction Medicine and is part of the Pennsylvania Advisory Council for Substance Use, offering guidance to the governor of Pennsylvania and the secretary of drug and alcohol programs. Angie has been actively involved in addiction and behavioral health workforce training since 2008, working on her first textbook with Springer due out next November. As a mother of two boys, she is dedicated to advancing addiction and behavioral health prevention and education to all, firmly believing that one young person dying from an overdose is one too many. So thanks so much, Angie, for joining us today. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you, Jayla. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, Pennsylvania Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, Penn State, Harrisburg, Shatterproof and the Public Good Projects. As Ashley eloquently said, my name is Angie. I'm a professional mental health and addictions therapist, profession, professor and researcher. And you can call me Angie. I am so grateful that you chose to spend an hour with me today. I do not take your time lightly. Um, for the most part, we are strangers, although I may know some of you out there. So thank you for coming, giving me your time. That's your biggest gift. Um, so healing for the healer, facing the stigma that keeps us and our patients unwell. What a large topic to take on in a little under an hour, but let's see what we can co-create together. When I use the word healer, you might be thinking hmm, that word does or does not resonate with you. In fact, just yesterday I had a large conversation or what I felt was large, maybe it was more small, but a, a conversation with the family medicine residents that I get the great honor of teaching and learning with. And they shared that this word does not resonate with them, but they offered a replacement word, um, facilitator of health. When I use the word healer, I like Dr. Thomas Agnew's definition of healer. And he writes about this in his 2005 manuscript, The Meaning of Healing to Transcend Suffering. And so whether you're joining me on this on this webinar as a parent, loved one, carpenter, teacher, counselor, administrator, government official, sister, daughter, father, mother, you have likely helped others transform their suffering through your mere presence, through a soft hand on their shoulder or staying with them during dark times. Um, Dr. Agnew shares in his manuscript that the transformation is towards a new sense of wholeness and perhaps wholeness after some sort of brokenness and, and using tools as simple as narrative tools and spirituality. And these tools are what we use to heal and thus transcend suffering. In addition to your healing work with others, I hope you've left some healing for your own transcendence along the way. Being with those that are struggling with mental health and addiction is a constant, for me, is a constant feeling of a loss and grief cycle. Um, we do it because we want the people we love to find their way back to wholeness and breath. So today we're going to sit with this topic, healing for the healer, facing the stigma that keeps us and our patients unwell. At the end of our amount of time together, Participants will be able to recognize the signs and how to prevent or manage compassion, fatigue, burnout, and trauma. Um, oh, these things that we perhaps know all too well through this line of work. Discuss the impact stigma has on us as a collective. Engage in some intentional practices, reflective practices. We're going to do those together today. You know, give yourself this gift of slowing down, of downshifting. So if you have a pen or a notepad handy, or even if you just have your cell phone in your notes pages, I'm going to have some general journal prompts and some mindfulness practices for us to do together um, so we can process the unintended consequences of your work 
and learn and discuss other tools to incorporate into our practice and among our teams to maintain our, our well-being, right? So we can continue to do um, the essential and important work that we do healing or facilitating um, somebody's suffering back towards wholeness. Okay, so what makes healers extraordinary also puts us at risk. And what makes us extraordinary is we know how to pull up a chair next to pain and we don't look away, right? We're resilient because often we ourselves are not strangers to this pain. None of us are exempt from um, struggle, pain. Also, we know that occupational health is now more relevant than ever due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But let me just quickly define these terms so you can recognize them in yourself. And also I wanna share a quick story if that's okay. So compassion fatigue. So this is a specific form of stress caused by caring for others. So which can lead to high emotional and physical exhaustion. So essentially high levels of empathy towards others as a result of caring can lead to compassion fatigue. So parents, <laughs> care workers, like compassion fatigue, kind of part of the job, right? Burnout, on the other hand, is this end state of long-term chronic stress. It is characterized, Maslock and Jackson through their work, characterized this by emotional exhaustion, which um, is a type of feeling that where individuals show difficulty adapting to the work environment since they lack sufficient emotional energy to cope with the tasks. Depersonalization, it often translates into negative or inappropriate attitudes and behaviors, irritability, loss of idealism, interpersonal avoidance, usually towards service users, patients, clients and reduced sense of self-efficacy, which is this negative professional self-evaluation and doubts about the ability to perform the job effectively. Um, so just a greater tendency to evaluate things negatively. So long periods of high levels of empathy and form that are causing forms of stress, chronic states of that, the end state of that is burnout, and often in our work, we take on a lot of psychological trauma or an experience of overwhelming our central nervous system because the experience that we are taking in exceeds our central nervous system's ability to cope and integrate these experiences. And so this is kind of part of what we do. It's part of the day in and day out. So it was 2006. I was a licensed therapist. I was, you know, seeing about 22 patients a day in addictions treatment, um, working back in Appalachia, back in the culture that raised me. That actually was the motivation for me to do the work that I was doing. At this time, at the young age of 26, I had lost too many people to count to drugs and alcohol and untreated mental health. I felt like I was a miracle myself to be at this place in my life, to have escaped some of the things that I had come out of. At this point, I was about 10 years into losing someone I knew monthly to um, these diseases. So as a result of that, I threw myself into my work. This is how I essentially transformed my own pain initially and my own trauma Maybe it was my survivor's guilt, but it, I met that with my job and with this urgency to go where no therapist had gone before. <laughs> um, the stories that I was willing to take in, the patients that I was willing to sit with, the stories of rape, violence, overdose, the deaths and redemptions on a daily basis, the diagnosis of sitting with somebody receiving a diagnosis of HIV or hepatitis, watching kids being taken away, kids being, um, coming back home, jobs being regained and lost. I would go home from work and sleep for four hours. My husband would say to me, that is not a nap. I would get up, I'd eat dinner, I'd go for a walk, I'd go to bed and I'd do it again. I found myself quickly burned out, quickly running to the bathroom and anxious on my way to work, exhausted, about life in general. I had nothing left for my own life. 
And in 2008, I found myself in my PhD program studying the impacts of spiritual well-being and if it predicted burnout and job satisfaction. And so being with you here today, what a kind of full circle moment of, you know, the work that I get to do with healers and, and with myself to stay well so we can continue the work that we're doing um, with patients to find their way back to health, home, and community and purpose. So what I... What we're going to do here for a second is just take a moment to pause and we are going to just collect ourselves and breathe together, ground together, right? Because we ourselves perhaps are all coming to our work with purpose, passion, and our own experiences and traumas and struggles, right? That we bring in with us every day. So the great poet Rumi reminds me that it's through our wounds that the light enters. So for the next slide, I just want to encourage you to take a moment, maybe like two minutes, 120 seconds, and we're just going to breathe together. Okay. Now that might make some of you anxious. So there's no right or wrong way to do this. The aim is just to collect yourself away from from everything, away from looking at your phone, away from the notes that you're checking or the to-do list and just be present with yourself. <clears throat> so if you could just take a moment to ground for a second, I invite you to dim your eyes, to close your eyes. I just invite you to come into your breath and on the next slide, some music's going to play and we'll just walk through grounding a bit, coming in touch with ourselves and slowing down. So the aim is to just sit with yourself. And if you've chosen to close or dim your eyes, just try to ground yourself somewhere, ground your hands, ground your feet. And honor the light in you that continuously goes up, and pulls up a chair next to those, finding their way back to their breath, finding their way back to their wholeness. But more importantly, maybe you are finding your way back to those things as well. So just come to your breathing, just inhaling and exhaling. The aim is try to inhale through our nose and exhale through the back of our throat and just find ourselves in the respiratory rhythm of our breath. Inhaling and exhaling. It's feeling our heartbeat Noticing the rise and fall of our stomach. And try to come in to a quick count of four if you can. If you can't, just breathe. Just observe and notice the things going on internally for you. But those of you that would like to come into a rhythmic count, I encourage you to do so. Exhaling together. Inhaling one, two, three, four. Exhaling four, three, two, one. Inhaling one, two, three, four. And exhaling four, three, two, one. Inhaling one, two, three, four. And exhaling four, three, two, one. And just staying with that rhythmic breathing. And you can just notice and observe your thoughts. You don't need to change them or stop them or anything, you can just observe them, observe your body, maybe you're gripping somewhere in your leg or your toes or your eye or your tongue. 
come back to your breath and try to release it. Just be present with yourself. Inhaling and exhaling. If you want to come back, just gently and slowly giving yourself this gift of breath of stillness, our, our breathing directly and indirectly affects our central nervous system. And Greg Miller talks about, you know, we inhale and exhale enough air to fill about 50 Goodyear blimps or more. We take in about 20,000 breaths a day. Breathing is essential to our living, to our life. We often take it for granted. It's the most physiological, um, reliable, and incredibly flexible thing we do. It impacts everything from our cognition to emotion. And it's ironic that in all of my jobs, this has been the main focus of our work. It's keeping our patients, our loved ones, our family members breathing, you know, fighting for access for Narcan, naloxone, rescue breathing to help people find their way back to breath. I think it's pretty amazing that the Latin word for spirituality is spiritus, which translates into breath. So, you know, what I want to kind of challenge you to consider is that your breathing is maybe perhaps your biggest tool, not only for yourself, but for your patients. So thank you if you went on that quick journey with me. So in addition to the work that we do, we often talk a lot about stigma. We know that stigma is the largest healthcare disparity in treating people with substance use disorders yet to overcome. It's the main topic of the campaign of Life Unites Us. You know, stigma can come from many different places. Um, it's defined as a deeply discrediting attribute, mark of shame, mark of oppression, devalued social identity. It can be policy related based on the policies maybe we see, you know, you're not successful in this place according to our policies if you're on this medication such as methadone. It could be public practice. You know, we don't take patients. Um, it is a public practice that we don't accept patients with active substance use disorder. We don't treat them here. Um, it can be self-induced. So I've internalized the stigma that I believe that I'm a dirty or a bad person. It can also be provider related. Um, provider related is when we, it's, it's the stigma of our work or that we experience at loved ones and family members um, as a result of the people or the loved ones we're associated with. We often talk about stigma like words to avoid, like dirty, clean, addict, relapse, user, and that the very words that we use can keep people from getting well and healing. And that's true. But we as carers, and providers also experience that stigma. And this kind of goes way back, way back. Like we can think about thousands of years, we can think about the caste system in India or the group, the lowest caste, the untouchables. These are groups of people that were excluded from structured social hierarchy. Um, but that was decided based on this group of individuals and the jobs that they had, you know, people having dirty jobs, quote unquote, or jobs that were unbecoming, right? And so when we think about the provider related stigma that we experience, if you can take a moment and, and talk about that, what you've experienced in the chat, 
in ways that plays out for you, I would love that. And thank you so much as, as you're thinking about what you're going to put in about the experience of provider related stigma in the chat. I just loved reading your names and where y'all are from and where you're practicing at. Thank you so much for doing that, taking the time to do that. Let's see. So anybody in the chat, the provided relator stigma experiences. Any examples of that? Any examples? Oh, let's see. Let me move my chat down. Char oh, hi. Lots of people from North Carolina. Any examples of provider-related stigma? Early on in my career, I worked in methadone treatment for a long time at one of the largest methadone treatment facilities in North Carolina. And it was a beautiful experience for me watching We Have, oh, uh, we have All the Answers. Thank you. It was a beautiful experience for me watching people get well um, so quickly as a result of the me medicine and as a result of their work that they were doing. However, as soon as I told people what I did in the small community that I was working in, I felt the instant shun. <laughs> you do what? Oh, you guys are over there by that rock quarry and you bring those people into this community. Discharging sun. Yeah, it was just instant experiences of what you do is a problem and we, you're not welcome here. Um, when I introduce myself and what I do, this is some stuff in the chat. Others feel very uncomfortable and shy away from the conversation. Yeah, just an instant um, uncomfortability, like, oh gosh, it's like an instant feeling of sympathy. Like you're over there. I, oh, I feel so sorry for you. Discharging someone might, discharging someone from treatment for confirming their diagnosis. <laughs> they think we really don't, we don't really care. Aren't you just in, oh, Kaylee, thank you. Aren't you just enabling them? Criticism from those who don't understand MAT service. <sighs> yes. Once an addict, always an addict. Dot, 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 maybe. Yeah. We are strong and don't need help. We have all the answers. Yeah. So the work that we do, whether it is, you know, choosing to show up every day, and help people find their way back to their breath. The work that we do often is undervalued. It's often um, underprioritized. It's looked at as you guys do that over there and stay away from me over here, right? Um, it lacks funding, <laughs> it lacks proper resources. And then the public kind of response to the work is yes, do that, but do that somewhere else, right? And that often impacts us, makes us isolate, makes us feel a lot of complex emotions about the work that we're doing. And we're watching people get their lives back. We While we watch people lose their lives, and that's very devastating, we also watch people come back to their wholeness. Um, in ways that have been the most miraculous thing I've seen and witnessed. Um, and there is a beauty to that, um, that I don't experience anywhere else, but in the work that I do. Yeah, so this stigma that our patients experience, where we also experience, and we ourselves are also healing, and we ourselves may um, come with their own traumas and trauma stories and recovery stories. And so sometimes the stigma is very layered. Yeah. And we're working to create a community and create a workforce and create programs that um, are hospitable and have the digni dignity and respect front and center that every human um, deserve. So thank you for sharing. 
your experiences. So just transitioning quickly, you know, as we go through this work that we do, like pulling up a chair next to people during some of their darkest moments, managing the stigma that we're up against by the work that we do, and also managing the stigma that our, our patients and our community is facing as a result of trying to heal. Um, we work on our skill sets that are active skills. And so one of the active skills that we pair is compassion and that we pair with empathy. So I want to talk a little bit about our use of these skills, compassion and empathy, and how we can use them to transform our own brokenness and how we can use them properly to prevent our experiences of compassion fatigue and burnout um, in the work that we do. So how it's kind of a parallel process of what how we work with our patients and how we work with ourselves to continue to show up and do this work. So it's this parallel process that we're on. So compassion, no one is immune to strength and struggle. And this work comes from Dr. Brené Brown's work and her qualitative work that is so eloquently laid out in Atlas of the Heart. And you can also watch um, those on HBO Max too. I think there's a five or six series on that, which is well, beautifully done. So compassion is not a practice of better than, or I can fix you. Compassion like literally translates to come with. It is a practice based in the beauty of pain of shared humanity. It's not, I'm separate from you. I'm way over here and I'm here helping you. Um, it's a daily practice of recognizing and accepting our shared humanity so that we treat ourselves and others with loving kindness. We take action in the face of suffering, and that includes our suffering as well, and our patients. It is radical acceptance of what is. We are very skilled at showing compassion towards our patients, our family members, our loved ones. But I really want you to ask yourself, how do you do this with yourself? How do you, on a daily basis, recognize your own shared humanity, treat yourself with the same kind of loving kindness? I asked a patient this the other day, and he said, that's why I come to therapy. Um, but the reality is, is this is internal work. And sometimes we need others to help us in turn um, stimulate our internal process but in addition to the compassion you show to come with your patients, how are you doing that with yourself? So the most effective approach to meaningful um, connection combines compassion with a specific type of empath empathy, which is cognitive empathy that Dr. Brown lays out beautifully. Empathy is active. It's something that we teach therapists. We teach peers. Like it's a, these are active skills that we teach people, like how to be actively empathic with people that you're sitting with. And I love how she differentiates between um, cognitive empathy and effective empathy. So empathy can use a combination of these two skills, um, empathy and compassion, but we can differentiate between cognitive empathy, this ability to have perspective, take perspective, mentalizing, the ability to understand, recognize another person's emotions, right? So this takes a bit of emotional intelligence that we can say, oh, I sense you're feeling complex emotions, that there's a mix experience of emotion. I hear you're, you're elated, you're relieved, you're sad, you're angry, you're infuriated, right? It's like there's leveling of emotions. Um, we're understanding what someone is feeling. We're reflecting that back to them in their stories. But what we're not doing a lot of, or we're trying to avoid is this experience of effective empathy or this experiencing of the sharing. And the quickest way I can get my body into the experience of this, like is one's own emotional attunement with another person's experience. Are you, have you ever watched those videos online where like someone is like 
on a skateboard or on something and they're doing an extreme sport and they hit their body and like you can actually feel it. It's like, oh, I felt that in my leg, right? Well, that happens to us when we're sitting with people in their pain. We can actually feel as if we're experiencing that ourselves or if we have experienced something similar, we can quickly go there. Now that, doing that in our work is a slippery slope. Early on in my career, I took like great pride in like sitting in these effective empathy states. And I had a lot of material to work with um, from my childhood and I could cry with patients and I could pull up a chair next to and I could commiserate with them. But that was like hot, what Brené Brown talks about as hot wiring a relationship. Like we're both kind of lost in the pain. And so effective empathy can be this slippery slope towards becoming overwhelmed and not being able to actually be or offer meaningful support. Where cognitive empathy is this perspective taking, we're staying up in this intellectual space. I'm staying out of my body with it, out of my pain. I'm helping them understand their experience and you know, I've been saying things like, does this sound right to you? Does this feel right to you? Making corrections along the way. And as, and you know, people are understanding their experience along the way, they're starting to understand what they need, right? So I love these conversations around near misses that lead to compassion fatigue or, you know, along the way. So far, like, what are some things that we do that are close to doing that, but they're not the right skill? They're not, and they feel close. Like you feel like you're in a relationship with yourself and with the patient, but actually you're quite enmeshed. You're you're both kind of lost in experiencing your emotions. So, you know, some near misses that lead to compassion fatigue in our work are focusing on my own emotional reaction. Like, yes, I know what that feels like. I've been there. Oh, I'm with you, right? Let me show you how much I've experienced this as well. You are not alone. And that often can leave people and yourself feeling quite drained. And not only had, did I have to carry my pain, but along the way I had to carry your pain. And we've maybe put that on the patient. Now, maybe I felt connected with you, but I've also carried your pain, focusing on my own distress and reaction than on the experience of the person. When I try to put myself in your place, rather than try to understand the situation from your perspective, our empathic connection unravels and I get sucked into the vortex of my own emotional difficulties uh, because my experience does not match yours. I doubt what you are telling me. Like the most um, risky time for me as a therapist is when the patient sitting across from me has a story similar to mine. And why is that the most risky time for me? Because I have all these near misses that I do with my empathy if I'm not innately present with myself and doing my work to stay present with the patient's story instead of using my own story to hotwire our connection and move kind of their healing off my kind of landing pad. And while, why that could maybe work, it kind of leaves people feeling, hmm, like it wasn't their own internal work and it it's just a near miss right it's there's like far misses to things like love and hate those are like two emotions that, that are either end on the spectrum but like empathy and sympathy sympathy is a near miss to empathy it's where we you know somebody appreciates what you're saying but they still feel very much alone um that they don't feel that you're with them right and so these are some near misses to that lead to compassion fatigue. So as a result of this work, like when we think about our compassion, our empathy, the work that we do to stay present with our patients, you know, we can think about this as a parallel process. And this is also the work that we need to do with ourselves. And as a result of this work, of our understanding of where we're at, where our emotions are at, to radically accept what is 
and what we need in our life, we can then begin to understand the boundaries that we need to set for the relationships we have. And Prentice Hemphill defines boundaries as the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. So to do this work as a family member, peer, or professional, we have to acknowledge that it's hard. We have to not only be skilled at pulling up a chair next to our, our loved ones or our patients who are suffering, we have to also leave time to connect with our own pain, false breath, and joys. When we lose ourselves in saving someone else, that becomes codependence and enmeshments. And it highlights our need for boundaries, the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. So this boundaries are a prerequisite for compassion and empathy. I must be clear in my role of where we begin but for me as patient and therapist, as professor and student, as researcher and, you know, person or institution I'm studying, where do we end and where do I begin? If there is not autonomy between people, then there's no compassion or empathy. There's just enmeshment. So read that again. If there is no autonomy between people, then there's no compassion or empathy. There's just enmeshment. And at the heart of it all is acceptance. So acceptance for me and what I need and where I'm at and acceptance for the patient as well. Um, enmeshment, losing myself within um, is, is not part of the healing. It's part of codependence. It's part of trauma bonding, you know, but we need to begin to pull apart so we can heal from a place that can sustain us and the work that we do. So as a result of our shared suffering and struggle, we begin to set boundaries, right? And boundaries really are the key to our own healing. And as a result of getting clear on our boundaries, we hold people accountable for their behaviors and we hold ourselves accountable um, to the things that we need. So to get there, we have to be with ourselves and acknowledge our pain and our struggles, have compassion and cognitive empathy for our stories. So just in summary here, compassion is this radical acceptance of what is and the ability to go with, okay? And you, you have to learn to do that with yourself efficiently before really you can master doing that with others. Empathy is perspective taking. What does this concept mean to you? What is the experience like for you? And empathy for yourself does something very similar where you're asking yourself the same questions. You're not distracting away from your pain, dissociating away from your pain. You're saying, what is this experience like for you? And then boundaries is this place where I can take care of me and you simultaneously. So what today, and for a moment, let's focus on ourselves. Like let's give ourselves this gift of empathy and compassion. And so if you have a journal, if you have a piece of paper, I want you to kind of focus your superpowers you have and use them on you. I'm gonna give you two slides with some prompts on them. If you need to take a moment to breathe and to sit with yourself for a second, you'll you'll have a couple minutes to do that. But there's going to be two slides and some music. So I want you to have some empathy. You're going to journal on some empathy about yourself, compassion towards yourself, some boundaries you might need. And then after you do that, there's going to be another slide. And I'll let you know when I flip to the other slide, um, kind of drilling down into those boundaries. Okay, so get your journal, get your pen out, get your markers out. Um, if you have a phone, you can get your notes page out. And here's the first journal prompt. So start with an empathy statement towards you and your work. Compassion, what is causing you chronic stress in your work? How can you radically accept what is? Boundaries, where do you need clarity so you can set better boundaries? 
In what ways do you struggle to take care of your patients, your work, yourself? So take a few moments to journal for yourself. Just give you a, a minute or two here. What things in your work do you need to communicate better boundaries? Have you done this? Are these boundaries possible? Is there room for negotiation? And once you're clear, what decisions do you need to make? So jot down a few notes here. So just jotting down a few notes about your boundaries, boundaries at work, boundaries with colleagues. Empathy and compassion statements to ex excavate our emotions. <laughs> I think once somebody gets in touch with their emotions, and we see this in therapy through perspective taking and not judgment, and they sit with what they are okay with and what they're not okay with. And that is always ever evolving and changing, right? Like as Maya Angelou said, when we know better, we do better. And as a result of that, when somebody shows compassion towards that experience of shared struggle and strength, people can move forward with setting boundaries for their life. You know, we often coach our patients about setting boundaries with people, places, and things, you know, ask yourself, how well are you doing that yourself? Um, often you're ready to ask for, you know, when you do this work, what you need to transform your, your emotion, your experience, your wellness, and people can respond as a result of you communicating that they can or cannot provide that. And that is okay. You are now clear on what it is that you need and looking for the right relationships that can sustain your growth and your wellness. Like we are all meant to grow and evolve. Um, and you know, while that's sometimes beautiful, it's often beautiful, it often comes with a loss and grief cycle, like growth itself is hard work. And that includes our growth in our work. But what I want to give to you is to honor like what you need to stay well in the work and like for you to honor that light and that inner knowing of what you need to stay well in the work. And to give yourself permission, the permission slips to do that. It might not happen overnight, but moving in that direction. So what I quickly would like to ask you, what tools do you use to connect to your own inner experiences and honor what you need to stay well in your work? If you can place some tool, you know, some things that you do um, in the chat, that would be wonderful. Some good clinical supervision. Is always a beautiful thing, and, you know, that story in 2000, um, 
and six when I was taking four hour naps after my clinical days, eating, sleeping, doing it again. And that's all I had the energy to do. You know, one of the great gifts I gave myself was some um, clinical supervision, even though I was licensed um, and that and connected with somebody that helped me um, connect with my story through journaling. But what do you all use? And I started journaling um, at the beginning and end of my clinical days. It wasn't like long or um, like, you know, heavy. It was just like putting some things down. But what tool? I don't know if you've ever heard of Balant, but with um, the residents that I work with, we do Balant once a month and it's a way to process how relationships, patient relationships are heavy on you and if you've been carrying them around and how we can take on the relationship in different ways. Um, they're beautiful um, balance circles. Any rituals that people use ensuring that I of having your own personal therapist when necessary, other supports for my own personal growth. Thank you, like Al-Anon and family groups. Beautiful. Thank you, Jesse. I mean, having colleagues that can truly uplift you and that aren't sarcastic or envious or jealous of you, but, you know, are really there to uplift each other can be a great source of light and support. Um, you know, get a bunch of people in a burnout state and the negative um, conversations that can begin to happen can just, if you're in a space like that, like just be aware of maybe of what's happening, right? Be a source of light, therapy, support groups, yoga, walking, ugh, all those things. Love that. Yoga is a big part of my daily practice. Yeah. And so what's interesting about the work is, is I find that I have to do it at work. Like I can't sustain my therapy work if I'm not finding time to do some of this breathing, grounding, journaling at work, or else I kind of leave work feeling like I'm not in my body because of the complex trauma work that I was doing a lot of. But that's was me being aware of what I needed. Um, and so I had to start getting really clear of like really needing my lunch breaks to tend to my wellness. And sometimes I just needed to do some laps um, and drink some water um, and not talk. Like I just needed to move my body and hydrate. But thank you so much for Tina and Jesse um, and Emery and everyone that typed in the chat. I really appreciate you. I'm going to stop sharing here in a second, but thank you for sharing the tools. My hope for you is that you have affection over attention, boundaries over tolerating, connection over attachment, mutual support over codependency, internal self-love over external validation, and healing over coping and trauma bonding. So stay connected. And my links are all in here. References and what questions, comments, and reflections do we have? Thanks so much, Angie, for walking us through that. Such a wonderful uh, presentation and also a reminder of how we can be kind to ourselves uh, while doing this work. So just had a few questions uh, from for you um, in this Q&A as we wrap up. But firstly, how do you maintain a sense of purpose and motivation in your work uh, with individuals struggling with addiction, especially during challenging times? Yeah, thanks. I think, you know, um, you know, I often think about like just my time seeing patients during COVID, right? Like I myself was going through this collective trauma and patients with co-occurring disorders are really struggling. Um, you know, it's really the simple things for me these days, like paying attention to small coincidences and pausing and seeing the all in those things. Um, while I like actively work on my own trauma, my own triggers and paying attention to my central nervous system through all those things that were mentioned in the chat, 
I also pay attention to like glimmers, like glimmers of joy or like new things or experiences that are happening in my work that are bringing these flow states times when I'm at work or working with patients that um, time kind of stands still, if you will, we're all kind of meant to grow and expand our patients, us. And so really while I work on my trauma, I try to pay attention to the joy and the glimmers as well and the small coincidences that are taking part and happening in my life as a result of this work. Yeah, thank you for that. And this this next question kind of aligns with what you're you've been talking about, but um how do you manage the emotional toll of witnessing a recurrence in symptoms in the recovery process? And maybe what strategies have you found helpful for maintaining a sense of um, hope and resilience. Yeah. I mean, all those things that pay, people talked about in the chat, like sometimes it's just like being able to sit with myself enough to notice that I'm in a state of compassion, fatigue, or burnout, mm-hmm. or I'm like teetering on unwell myself, right? Like it's really taken me a long time to recover from my patient encounters And then as a result of that, like when I'm paying attention to myself and giving myself compassion and empathy and grace, sometimes I need to hit pause. Like I need to then turn back and do some things for me. And sometimes that has meant like putting down my clinical practice or shifting my roles and, and being brave enough to have, um, to have my own back. So I can maintain my sense of resilience in this work. And and that just kind of ebbs and has ebbed and flowed like through the 24 years of my career, but it's like a muscle you're building. And the more I give myself permission to do that. Yeah, thank you. And I'm noticing a lot of positive comments uh, in the chat. So uh, just one more question uh, for you before we wrap up. And you mentioned this at the end too, in terms of just building supportive communities. But in what ways can the professional community support each other in preventing and addressing emotional burnout among providers um, in this field? Yeah, I think we're just all in this together. Like when we're starting to like split hairs over who or what or what's the best practice or AA or support groups or it's religious, it's not or, you know, treatment against harm reduction. It's like, oh, you know, I have deep respect for all of the people showing up to help people heal in our community. And we're not against each other. Like we have to like lift each other up. And so I really have started like, not only like, am I paying attention like to the larger community or the people right in my direct circle, but like, I am not here to fight you or be envious of you. Like there is not a scarcity here. Like we are all here contributing to helping people breathe and live there and get back to their, their lives. And it's almost like, I, I don't have time to be against you. And so I think my biggest kind of like, it's my biggest suggestion is like, if you find yourself in that place, you know, I just really take a moment and pause and ask yourself if that really is your mission. Is, is that what you're here to do? And that we're all collectively evolving to help people heal and we're all getting better at it. And we can't do that if we're against each other. So my main message is for us to lift each other up and love one another, that we're all here healing and helping people heal simultaneously. So thank you. Thanks so much, Angie. And with that last minute, um, we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much for attending. Jayla will drop the survey link in the chat. Always encourage you to provide your feedback. It's how we get ideas for topics in the future. Um, So thank you all for taking the time. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.